So before I begin, I'm going to be talking a bit about the, the technology that we've used to enable continuous delivery, but also about the cultural changes that we made. So just to get a, a feeling, because we've only got half an hour to talk about all of this, um, how many of you are more interested in the, the technology side of it? And how many in the culture side of it? Okay, that's more unanimous than I expected. <laughs> okay, so the, the more technical slides I'll probably skip over a bit more quickly and we'll spend a bit more time on the cultural stuff. Um, so this is about the, the, the six stages that we went through over a period of uh, two or three years, um, starting from being a bit of an enterprise dinosaur to where we consider ourselves now as to being pretty much in the space age. Still plenty more to do, but we've, we've had a hell of a ride. So to give you a little bit of background about SAP to start with, um, been around for quite a long time since the, you know, the mainframe era. You can actually see a couple of our founders on the left-hand side there on their original IBM mainframe with the card decks and so on. Um, and where we are now is in an almost a quarter of a million customers around the world, um, a huge number of employees, 60,000 employees. In fact, one of the reasons that I come and talk at conferences like this is the easiest way for other people in SAP to find out about what my group is doing is by Googling things like continuous delivery in SAP and finding conference talks that I do. Um, it's actually more effective than the internal grapevine. Um, and the complexity of the software that we build, you know, we've been around for 40 years, so that the legacy is quite huge. So our main uh, enterprise resource planning suites, the, just the database schema for that is more than 30,000 tables. And that was a shock to me uh, in my software career to, to come across a piece of software that was completely beyond the possibility of one person to, to comprehend. You, know, you have to divide and conquer with this stuff. Um, so our vision is to help the world run better. And one of the ways we're helping to achieve that is, is our customers produce, as it says there, a large proportion of the world's chocolate and beer. So I'm not going to talk about SAP as a whole and the entire business suite side. I'm, I'm going to talk about my little corner uh, where I work in SAP's IT division. Um, and I'm part of the, the group that's responsible for putting out uh, a lot of our websites, especially the more collaborative kind of websites where people register. And a few years ago, we found ourselves in, you know, we're, we're working on a platform, delivering software using a version of Java that had gone out of support two years earlier um, to this big proprietary application server where just performing a restart took maybe 20 minutes to see if any code had worked. Um, we weren't entirely bad. I mean, we, we thought we were agile. Um, so, you know, we had a monthly release, for example, which isn't too bad for back then. Um, obviously, it's a lot better now. But, for example, we were working with physical hardware. So if we wanted to do a new project, you're talking about lead time for hardware of several months of talking to vendors, getting the, the infrastructure team to plug it in, uh, the operating system team to install an operating system and so on. It just took a long time. Um, also, on each monthly release, uh, someone would write a release script that says you need to deploy these artifacts here, then tweak these configuration parameters. It took you know, most of a day to do a deployment, and obviously it's, it's prone to errors as well. And we had a mostly manual QA cycle. So within that monthly cycle, uh, we'd be writing code. Well, on paper, it said we were writing code for a month. Um, in practice, we were handing the code over to QA after two weeks. Then in theory, we'd start on the next month cycle. What really happened, of course, is in those two weeks, QA would be finding bugs, handing them back to developers. And so it actually turned into two weeks of development and two weeks of bug fixing. And perhaps one of the more damaging things from a continuous delivery point of view is that the, the developers, the, the ops guys doing the actual deployment of the artifacts, and the, the guys who are responsible for keeping the lights on were in three completely different business units. So obviously in a large organization, you, know, you try not to have politics, but some of it's inevitable. There's a bit of a not invented here syndrome. Um, and elements of that did affect us, you know, having to, to basically throw things over organizational boundaries to get things done. So we got to a point where in 2010, um, our units of about 100 people 
Um, that equates to about 20,000 person days of available effort in one year. And we found ourselves handed a portfolio uh, that when we stuck the estimates on it, showed it was going to take three times as much effort as we had available to deliver that portfolio. So we had to really rapidly find a way of eliminating a large amount of waste from our process. So that took us into the, the next stage where we had a, a new project starting off, and that's the project that I work on. So again, a little bit of background on that. So SAP, the big enterprise resource software, part of the idea of that is it does everything from human resources, invoicing, purchasing, everything in the back end of a company. And the point of that is there's one version of the truth in this big system. There's just one database backing everything. At the same time, if you went to our website on the marketing side, you could create an account for that. Um, if you're a developer wanting to do extensions, there was another developer website and you could register for that. And between all of the various websites we had in this big enterprise, um, some people perhaps needed to create 10 different accounts to register and talk to this company that was selling them the concept of one version of the truth. So it was a little bit embarrassing. Um, so the project I work on, the ID service, was set up to, to unify all of those so the business still had the agility where it could do lots of different websites. We had a common user database, and so people signed up once, and they could use those account credentials to get into any part of the system. So it then looks a lot more like one SAP to the outside world. Um, so putting all of the existing systems together gave us about 4 million users. Um, then, of course, we've acquired a couple of companies in the last few years that are cloud-based companies. And that's given us another 20 million or so. And the CEOs have given us a helpful target of 2015. We need to have a billion users in that system. So that's the challenge within our project as well. We've got to scale to you know, almost Facebook scale within that period of time. Um, so we've done that. We've gone the agile way. We've got a cross-functional team, all the usual roles. Unusually, um, the company standard is when we're doing scrum type stuff to try and have co-located teams. But for historical reasons within IT, because of all the various acquisitions and combining IT departments from the acquisitions, uh, we have people all around. So our particular team is composed of people from, from five countries, you know, Germany, Bulgaria, UK, Russia, and Israel. So we do have that challenge. Although the one helpful thing that mitigates that is we're all within two hours of each other, time zone-wise. Uh, and that's one thing that we found very helpful compared to other outsourcing type things I've done in the past. Having more or less the same office hours is very helpful indeed. Uh, so for this new project, we also we decided not to use the big monolithic application server, but um, SAP starting to get into the cloud game uh, developed a, a much lighter weight server based on Tomcat and OSGI. Um, we called it the Lean Java server internally, and that's, you can restart that in you know, a minute or two. Uh, so we decided to use that to try and decrease our cycle time for development. But otherwise, we carried on using our existing toolkits. Um, so Jira and Bamboo for issues and, and continuous integration, doing Perforce for version control, Eclipse, Ant, all that kind of thing. So that was our starting point. We just really changed the platform to make it a bit quicker. Um, and also, you know, a developer could run their own Tomcat server rather than having a shared server, which is what we had before. But really, we still had a lot of waste to get rid of. You know, that maybe took care of about 10, 15 percent of our waste. So faced with still a, a large task to get all of this portfolio delivered, uh, my boss, the, the chief architect in our group, um, he'd read Jez's book. Um, so he promoted these principles to the team that you know, everything has to be automated. We have to do automated testing. Everything has to be in version control. And in fact, all of his team, he put it in our performance review objectives that we had to read Jez's book, which is really good for Jez's uh, royalties. Um, and my project was, was adopted as the pilot project for putting all of this into practice. Now, at the same time, his boss um, trusted him to do that. And that's one of the things that was critical. You know, we, we didn't do a big top-down enterprise agile thing. Uh, this was done almost as a guerrilla thing. So with the, the sort of lower two levels of management, one guy actually driving the vision and the guy above him providing air cover, 
that enabled us just to get on and do what we needed to do. And how that was done was essentially within all of that, 10% um, of any given sub-project budget was given over to putting continuous delivery technology in place. So a lot of the, the tools you'll see in the rest of the talk were done by people on this 10% time. Um, that wasn't really a, a Google-like Friday working. It was more like the 10% of the people who were really into doing this sort of thing formed a bit of a black ops team and put it all into practice. So the first phase of that was really making sure that we got rid of this lead time for getting hold of hardware. Um, so we basically, the one hardware purchase we did was for a big ESX server that gave us the ability to have lots of virtual instances. Uh, and that finally gave the ability for each developer to have their own server to run everything on, to be able to run all of the tests and everything else. Um, and that meant that if you wanted a server to run a project on, at the time you emailed one of the ops team, they ran a bit of a script, you know, they allocated something in, in ESX server, told you the DNS to go into, gave you credentials, and they installed the Chef client on it. Is everyone here familiar with Chef? Yeah. Um, so the idea there is we set up a Chef server in, in our IT area, and that had all of the recipes on. Um, so then any given developer just said, well, you know, I need MySQL, I need Java, I need Tomcat, you know, install these recipes. So you can see there the, you know, it's a, a sample bit of Chef Ruby dialect. It's just a DSL that says, you know, I want to install these packages. I might put some conditional logic in to say, depending on the platform, do it differently. And the idea is we're abstracting something that could be done with a simple shell script, but it's done in such a way that it can work across multiple platforms and it's repeatable. And from the developer's point of view, okay, some developers were, were into the, the Ruby level and creating recipes. But for those that weren't, weren't into that level, they were just able to, to drag and drop things. So they went on to the, the overall chef server, they clicked on their node, and then they can just drag and drop roles and recipes. And then the next time they run chef client on their machine, it installs everything they need. So that was the, the automation of one layer of actually getting rid of the waste of waiting to provision hardware. Um, then we needed to be able to automate the testing. You know, half of our effort was going into manual testing. Uh, we had no culture of developer-created tests at all. Um, you know, JUnit, all that sort of thing. You know, we all knew about it, we all wanted to do it. We didn't feel before that we'd have the space in which to create that kind of thing. Uh, the QA team had created some automated tests, but that was using some of the very expensive seat license tools that were available at the time. So it just wasn't economically possible to give developers access to that level of technology. Uh, and even so, those automated tests were just run as part of this monthly cycle. Um, so it was causing us a lot of trouble. So we discovered Selenium, and that's one of the early tools that, that helped us along a lot, is just being able to record scripts in a browser and play them back, and developers having access to be able to do that um, made things a lot quicker. Uh, developers got instant feedback. Um, we didn't have to wait for that monthly cycle. Uh, the only thing we did have to do, of course, is create test scripts. Um, and so going from zero to covering everything w was a challenge. And the strategy we adopted for doing that was just to say, well, the only thing we really need to cover first is the happy path. For everything we're doing in our system, let's just look at the, the way it's meant to work, put a, script, a quick recording together for saying, yep, yeah, if you click A, B, and C, it comes out with the right screen at the end. Let's not worry too much about the error cases or the edge cases. Just make sure the basics are covered. And then what we did is, as we gradually went along, and, and manual testing may find a, a particular bug or an edge case that we hadn't covered, then we'd do that on a, you know, creating a test on failure basis. So sort of on-demand test creation that meant over time we evolved to a situation where all of those edge cases got covered. Um, so by this point, we've, we've done a fairly good job. We've noticed that although we've got rid of, rid of a lot of the previous waste, we've still got manual processes here to, to operate these new tools. Um, so you, know, you have to email an ops guy to get him to create you a VMware server. Um, the chef client has to be installed. So one of our bright guys actually pulled all of this stuff together and automated that into a script that we called Cocktail. 
Um, and that really gave us our first level of automation where it turned from you know, maybe a couple of hours of emailing people and them doing things fairly quickly into just running a script to achieve the same job. So then we decided to, to ramp up a notch more. Um, so we, we had some test coverage, but it was all very internal focused on the team, very technical level. So we decided to move towards Cucumber because this is where we started getting a bit more agile and more able to talk to the business. Um, we, at the same time, I mean, I'll talk about it a bit more later, we got heavily into Scrum. So the product owner now could start talking in terms of these Gherkin scripts, which are just in, in English language. They're a little bit technical. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to do what Matt Wynn says as much as possible and make them business focused, but that's one of our areas of continuing to improve. But as you can see, it's fairly straightforward there. You've got a scenario description, uh, given, when, then. And in, now we've defined that our definition of done. So when we actually want to complete a user story, just having the code there isn't enough. It won't actually count as done unless there's a test. And so for every JIRA ticket we create for a story now, we actually create a sub-ticket for the Cucumber test. And then the, the JIRA is set up so that the, the master ticket can't actually be set to done unless the sub-ticket is completed. Uh, from a developer's point of view, Cucumber is really nice because it's very easy to map Cucumber steps onto Java code to perform the testing. Um, as you can see there, you know, that one line when I'm using my valid credentials easily maps onto some code that says get me a username, get me a password, and try and do a login. At the same time, something we've developed recently um, that's also making a big difference is on each story we've, we, within Cucumber, we've got this annotation at user story, and that contains the JIRA ID of the actual user story itself. And we've written a reporting tool now that you can see on the bottom right there, gives us a report that tells us all about the test coverage. So product owner now can see not only here's the user story that I wrote, but here are all of the automated tests that cover it that I can look at in Gherkin in plain language. And also I can see when they're running, how long they take to run. So we're getting a, a bit of an overview of performance as well. And from an audit point of view, we can see, you know, if you've only got one test for a particular user story, that's okay, but maybe it's better to have three or four covering some different edge cases. So then we decided to ramp up our continuous delivery technology in another stage. So from the cocktail tool where we're able to run some basic scripts, but we've got the central chef server. The problem we had with the central chef server is we had by then you know, six or seven projects all using this chef server with this one combined set of recipes. So someone on one team decides that the, the recipe for installing Tomcat needs a bit of a tweak for their project. But they don't really think about the impact on all of the other projects of that tweak. So in fact, having one chef server works OK within a team, but not so well across multiple teams. So we need to now set up one chef server for every project. Um, also, we want developer self-service. You know, it's, it's nice sending an email and something comes back a couple of hours later, but what would be really good is to get an instant virtual machine created. And we want everything under version control. You know, that's, we automate everything, everything's under version control. If you're having to email people to set things up, that's not very version-y. So we developed a, a, a next level tool called Barkeeper, which manages all of this. And that gives us this YAML text file that describes an entire project. So you can see there we've got the project description, we've got the ID of the Git repository, um, and then towards the bottom half you can see, that in this case, test and prod, it's a, a sample of a file, there's other for dev and, and private developer stuff. But in each case we're actually describing, here are the servers we need, here are the initial recipes to run. And so an entire project, its entire landscape, is captured in one text file that's now under version control. And that text file is read by the Barkeeper tool, so that now the, there's a web UI on top of that, reading all of the, the files of all of the projects. And a developer who wants to work on a new project just goes to the, the list on the left, says that's all of the projects that Barkeeper is managing, uh, clicks on one of them, 
clicks create me a virtual machine and it will just go off and within a few minutes that developer then has all of the servers he needs to work on that project. So with that tool and its ability to be automated via REST as well, um, this is now how our bamboo pipeline looks. So we've got an initial, you know, actual compiling the code step. Get a mouse onto there. Um, that's installed onto the development server. And then we have all of the test suites running. Um, the reason there's so many suites there is because Bamboo runs all of the stages in a particular group in parallel, so they all run at the same time. Once all of the tests are complete, then we know it's OK to install onto the, the QA and test landscapes, where we do a quick smoke test and then run another test suite. And then also you'll see we've got the blue-green deployment there. So once it's into QA, we check that it's basically OK and then deploy it to blue and green so it's available to everyone. And the reason is that it's semi-productive in the sense of the, the project that we're building is used by other projects for their sign-on. So what for us is our QA system is also the system that other projects use to do their development. So for them, it's productive. If there's a big problem in QA, they can't develop anymore. So we have blue-green even at the QA level. And then, as you can see there, the, the grayed out section on the right is for production. Um, so every build doesn't yet go to production. But it's very simple. If we want to do a release to production, all we do is go into Bamboo, just enable those steps, and click build, and that's uh, a deployment to production completed. So that gives us some lessons, the major one of which is the cycle time is critical. Um, the amount of time from a developer hitting commit to getting feedback is one of the main bottlenecks in doing development. Um, so as you can see from the graph on the right, that's from Bamboo showing the, the build duration. And you can see it's gradually, gradually increasing here. So we've just added an extra five minutes and then it drops down again. And that's because we've got a rule that when we see that starting to creep up beyond a certain threshold, um, you saw all of the, the test suites on the previous page running in parallel. Um, each of those is composed of lots of, of steps and scenarios. As you can see, we, we have over 700 scenarios at the moment. So every time we see one of those steps creeping over three minutes, or if we see the overall build creeping over sort of 15 minutes for that stage, then we look and go in and split up um, so we get even more parallelism, uh, and then it drops down again. And so those are our current targets, is for the actual test stages to complete, we want that done within 15 minutes. And we want the overall build and deploy to QA done within 40 minutes, so that the, the impact of a, of a red build is minimized as well. So we know about a red build in under an hour, and if that's not fixed within 30 minutes, or you know, if a developer hasn't said, I've got the fix ready to deploy in 30 minutes, then they know that, that it's time to issue a revert commit to get it back to green. As you can see, very recently, there was a, a build that took almost two hours. That was just an anomaly. I think it was some infrastructure problem that's making the graph look weird. So a quick recap on where we've got so far. That's mostly technology stuff, a bit of culture. Um, but we've gone from monthly releases to now we release to production on average twice a week. Um, the QA cycle is now well under a day. Um, essentially, the manual QA portion is now is looking at the, the tickets for that sprint and just quickly going through and making sure the developers didn't miss any corner cases. The regression is taken care of from the, the automated test suite. Um, before, in our old system, if there's any kind of production error, it was the classic, you know, pager goes off, logging in at 2 a.m., and that's really not the best frame of mind to be fixing a bug. Um, especially when there's a stress of it being an important bug. Uh, now, because we have blue-green deployment in QA and in production, if there's any kind of problem like that, all we do is just switch back to the other release when it was working fine, and then go and get some good sleep, and then come in the next morning, think about it properly, fix it properly, and there's no panic. Um, before, it took you know, six months to get a new idea into live production because of ordering the hardware. And that actually stifled innovation. When you've got a six-month cycle time just to see something live, there's a lot of ideas that just don't even get done. Whereas now with the, the barkeeper, you know, someone writes a text file, you can create 
all of your servers in dev, QA, production, write some code, deploy it, have the tests. If you can write the code quickly enough, we can have a new project live in production in a week. Uh, and that's mostly for internal stuff, but that's created some interesting internal applications that people have written. And as a result, the business is obviously a lot happier with what we're doing. Um, even more so with SAPs doing more in, in the cloud area of things, what we've found is these techniques and technologies that we've been developing within IT, we're now actually working with the development side of the company to make them part of our cloud product as well. So it's, um, it's great. It's one of the, the big revolutions we've had in SAP and IT in the last few years is rather than being a cost to the business, we're now a net benefit to the business through working on technology uh, and also being through our own reference customer. We try and use our own software wherever possible and then we can help the sales guys sell it as a result. But that is technology and there's still a lot more about the team. And really what enabled us to build the technology was the, the transformation that we had as a team. Um, now I've already spoken about the initial part of that, which was around the, the management cover and the, the vision of, of the chief architect. So we decided to do Scrum at quite an early point in time. But what we decided to do was the Scrum that we'd read about by reading web pages and articles. So that ended up as a, as a daily stand-up um, pretty much all it was. In fact, it turned into a daily argument. You know, it was just the argument of the day. Um, so we did get some better communication out of that, uh, but not a huge amount of extra productivity. What really made the difference is deciding to invest in, in Scrum training. And it was actually not just from a Scrum training company, but from an agile coaching company as well. So. We spent an entire week, you know, got the whole distributed team together in, in Berlin, which is where most of the team members were. And we had deep learning about Agile and Scrum. So actually doing the hands-on exercises together, experiencing what waste felt like with Lego blocks and post-its, and really learning how it meant to work. But also, because this was, was Agile coaching, the coaches themselves adapted to our unique situation of being distributed. Um, so, in fact, one of the guys on the team couldn't make it from London to Berlin. Um, his passport was running out, he just couldn't make the flight. So he was left back in London. So we did the whole coaching with him. Um, we were all around a desk in a workshop in Berlin. We had a laptop with Skype, and he was on the camera on the laptop as, as a virtual member of the team. And that actually helped us work in our distributed mode as well. So in some of the exercises where I needed, needed someone to be a product owner, we decided that he would be the product owner, so we had this sort of uh, remote head on a screen telling us what he wanted to do for that exercise. Um, and similarly, for the pair programming tasks in how we learnt, for the, we didn't just sit around a desk together and pair because we're a distributed team, we, we, we can't do that. So within the building, we actually sent some developers to other offices in the building, and we did the exercises over phone on the extension, you know, with headsets on or with remote video. So we actually, really worked with what we had. And as a result, we've really managed to make being a distributed team work very well for us. So we've got this culture now where we're always trying to improve what we do ourselves. And we, we try new things all of the time. Um, we had to introduce code review, for example. Now, being an ID service, you know, we need to make sure no one's bringing in any security problems. So initially, the code review was just to ensure that security problems weren't there. What we found was that using Garrett for code review was another way that enabled pair programming in a distributed way. So when you want to swap the keyboard, what we found was all you need to do in Eclipse is to click push to Garrett, and the other person does fetch from Garrett, and in 10 seconds, they've got all the latest code updates. And, and that's working just off a patch together, so it's not even committed to the main code base. So the two people can collaborate on a patch using Garrett, and it makes it very easy just to swap over the keyboard. Um, similarly, we've been working with Pomodoro technique a little bit. That one didn't work out so well, but it was a cheap experiment to do. And the latest one we're doing is something we're calling ProdOps. So, as you saw on the continuous pi integration pipeline, the, the production part was grayed out, and that's, there's a bit of permission control around that, so only the ops guys can actually send it to production. And at the moment, the product owner sends an email to the ops guy, as you can see there, can you send this deployment to production? Now, we figured out that actually, because this was being done in Bamboo, and Bamboo has a REST API, this can be automated. 
So this is what we're working on at the moment. We've got a, a physical device which the product owner has, and all the product owner does is he can use the buttons to select the right build number that he wants to take to production, inserts the key, unlocks it, flips up the switch, and presses the button. And that just uh, uses a Raspberry Pi inside the box to call the REST API and actually perform as a production deployment. But you have to have the key to be able to do that, so that's the security. So I'm out of time, slightly over time in fact, so thank you very much for listening. I hope it was useful. Thank you.